Let's pray. Lord, use our eyes as windows to our hearts and speak to us through what we see today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm here today as part of the John Gratian Lectureship Series, established by the Graduate Studies, uh, Graduate School Intercultural Studies Department. Dr. Gratian was our founding chair. You'll find this in BGC 255 if you want to see the plaque a little bit closer. It was established to continue Dr. Gratian's love for contextualization, which is at the intersection of culture and faith, is an ongoing project all the time. All of us tie into contextualization. Uh, the challenge is whether we're aware of it or not. Sitting in a wonderfully air-conditioned, isolated from the railroad tracks chapel that's actually floating on massive springs uh, in nice, comfortable chairs, that's not how the first century church met. It was different. We are contextual beings. Uh, the longer I've been here, I've realized that students really want to see faculty as something other than faculty. They want to see us as human beings. And so I found a little bit more personal introduction to who I am will be helpful than just my career path. Uh, that's me, the baby. My oldest brother is experimenting on my face. As my second brother looks on in sheer delight, that explains a lot of who I am. Any of you PsyD students who need a special project, I'm available. <laughs> One of the results was uh, my sense of fashion, as you can see clearly in the images here. What you don't see in that seventh grade picture is that I'm also wearing plaid trousers to go together <laughs> with, with the rest of it. Uh, here now, in, in 1977, I'm modeling the wrinkle-free nylon gown that we have that uh, I didn't get the memo on ironing before graduation. Uh, and if I had, I probably wouldn't have ironed it anyway. I'm that type of a geek. After graduation, I moved on to Swaziland. Uh, that's my school where I taught Anton Janey Swazi National High School. It was a public high school. I taught physics and general science to 10th graders. I continued my fashion sense while I was there. Uh, here I am in a wedding in Swaziland. I know some of you look at that and wonder why I'm not yet married myself at this stage in my <laughs> life, but the reality is I wasn't. The white bow tie is obvious, the white gloves are a little less obvious to you. Uh, perhaps you've seen that I'm not smiling. Uh, the reality is I was so busy concentrating on the dance step I had to use going into the church with the bridesmaid and we were told the groomsmen are not allowed to smile because it means you're gloating over the bride's family. So I was glad I wasn't allowed to smile. I don't think I could have done that and two-stepped in at the same time. <laughs> From Swaziland, I went to Kenya. Clearly, I've married in between these two. <laughs> <laughs> there I served at the Nairobi International School of Theology for almost eight years. In Kenya, I met my wife and three of our four children were born there. Uh, continuing to follow God's call, my family and I came back to Wheaton in 1991, which means I've been teaching here longer than some of you have been alive, and that's just evil. I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, in my life as a missiologist, I focused on this issue of contextualization. Sometimes it involves doing dangerous things. Uh, that is a living tiger. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, come to lunch with me. Uh, but not everything we do is that dangerous. Uh, Biblical truths are universal as we focus on contextualization. So you've got the scriptures translated. We're all to pray. How we pray varies widely from culture to culture and society to society. The first time I prayed in a Pentecostal church, Mati, uh, sorry, a tin roof in, in Kenya, a thousand people gathered in a church that would comfortably seat 600 uh, and they were, the praise band was playing music with everything cranked up, and they said, okay, now we're all going to scream out in prayer as loud as we can, and then we'll bubble over into tongues. Um, and, and so you've got a thousand people sitting there, not sitting, standing, screaming at the top of their lungs. It wasn't prayer as I learned it at Wheaton College, <laughs> that I can guarantee you. 
As an institution, Wheaton's orientation is certainly towards the cognitive life of the mind, and especially that's true for graduate students. Our Dine with a Mind program is clear evidence of that, and there is no truth to the rumor that the grad dean's office is considering a beer with an ear program for graduate students. <laughs> um, that's, that's simply not going to happen, I have to let you know. And Wheaton examines such areas as contextualization with a cognitive lens. Tools, exegesis, systematic theology, psychoanalysis. But you're more than just brains. So are we as faculty. So this morning, rather than focusing on the cognitive, I'm going to focus on the visual and the emotional. And that you can see already. Uh, clearly, I'm a visual learner. This fits best who I am. In exploring contextualization, I want you to feel it, not just think about it. Many ways we could do that, song and dance, but you already know I don't dance and you haven't heard me sing, you don't want me to sing either. Uh, we could do it through ritual, we could do it through story and drama, but I'm choosing instead to focus on images. What I want to do is lead you through a visual meditation on contextualization, a type of visual reconnaissance through Christ's life, starting with the incarnation and walking on through to the crucifixion. Uh, as a caveat, I am a visual learner, but I am not an artist nor am I a videographer. This is a passion, not a profession. I'm going to start with what is perhaps the best known image of Christ in the world, painted by a native to Chicago, Warner Salmon. While studying at Moody, the dean told him this, quote, sometime, I hope you give us your conception of Christ. And I hope it's a manly one. Most of our pictures today are too effeminate. Well, this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus you see as the result. Created in 1941, it's been reproduced an estimated 500 million times. Soldiers would carry pictures of this in their, in their wallets, in their pockets, sometimes as a magic charm that would protect them from bullets, sometimes just because they wanted to feel close to the Lord, and war brought them into a setting where they knew they needed that more than they did in peace. Most of you, like me, can connect to this serene yet strong Jesus because he looks like me. Perhaps he looks like you. But living contextually in Africa forced me to question my comfort with this portrayal. In a widely viewed YouTube a TED Talk, author, Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie warns us of the danger of a single story. The extent to which Solomon's image of Christ represents your single story is a challenge. You need to expand that, and I'm hoping to do that today. So instead of starting with Chicago, we go to Finland. I'm sure you didn't expect to see a black Christ from Finland. It's not a place that's well known for African or African descended population. But this was created as part of an ad campaign for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland designed to attract a new audience to the Finnish church. But you catch the irony, a secular ad campaign, a Finnish church and a black Christ. This was not the only image they portrayed. They also had a female Christ and a hippie-style Christ. Jesse really digs you, man. <laughs> but none of these actually resemble Jesus of history, a first-century Palestinian Jew. Of course, we don't know what that looks like, but we can go to a forensic anthropologist who reconstructed this startling image for the BBC. Based on first century Palestinian skulls, he tried to imagine what Jesus looked like. At least the facial structure is right, whether the color tone or whether the hair is correct is a different uh, question that could be asked. But I do need to ask, which one perhaps more closely represents the forensic anthropology image? I dare say it's not Salman's picture. And that's what contextualization tries to get at. I've been interested in these images of Christ now, and over the last 15 years I've been collecting them. I've got about 5,000 images right now from all over the world. Uh, images from Africa, if this makes you dizzy, you can close your eyes for a second, you'll recover soon. Images from Asia, images from Latin America, and then images from the Pacific. I do have some parameters on the collection, however. Uh, I try and avoid too much kitsch. Jesus and Elvis, no, I ban myself from that. So well, let's start with the visual reconnaissance and wind our way through a trail of images that will bring you, perhaps as a result, a bit closer to Christ. 
First, we'll go to Mexico. Father Hernando, uh, Fernando Arizzi's depiction of the Incarnation. Born in Mexico, he lived and ministered in the U.S. and Benin, West Africa, where he died in a motorcycle accident while ministering there. He rightly argued that the U.S. black community needs a Jesus with whom they could relate. He writes this about these images, quote, In the image on the left, we see a Zulu warrior and a princess both looking to the sky. Below them are two slaves representing the millions of Africans brought in shackles from Africa. The slaves are divided from the Zulus. They will never see their homes again. To their right are slaves on plantations in the deep south, looking steadfastly to the sky. Continuing to the right are the descendants of the slaves. Though their lives have changed since the civil rights movement, today they are still victims of prejudice at most levels of society. To the far right are the souls of the deceased, Ascending to God as the sun descends from God's hand, this is Emmanuel, he writes, God with us, end quote. This Mexican-born Jesuit priest clearly illustrates for us that black lives matter to God. And as the record showed on Friday, if you haven't seen it, uh, a depiction of black students facing issues of profiling in the city of Wheaton, our city has yet to learn this lesson. From here, we move to Mexico. From, from Mexico, we go to Palestine. Uh, a young Palestinian Christian artist painted this two months after his family home had been hit by a missile. He saw children dead in the street. Imagine writing or painting this image of the slaughter of the innocents with this as weighing on your heart at the time you're putting this together. Perhaps you can begin to soak yourself in what the artist was thinking as he imagined Christ at this point in time. This flight to Egypt painting comes from Uganda, the context of refugees fleeing the brutality of someone known as the Madman of Africa. That was Idi Amin back in the 1970s. When a Ugandan saw this class, uh, this image in class, he said, that's my people. What he meant by that was they're dressed just like he would have dressed. He was alive at the time. You see, the painting was made in the 1980. Amin was deposed in 1979. This was still fresh on the mind of the artist as he thought about fleeing to Egypt. And I ran across Ugandan refugees in Kenya when I was there on a regular basis, <coughs> Christians fleeing because of the persecution they faced. I just love this image. Jesus chilling on the beach with the disciples. Isn't that kind of cool? He's the one in shades there. Sometimes we fall into the trap of docetism, Jesus seeming to be human but not really being human. This Indonesian artist captures his humanity and the common shepherd folk that he ministered among. From here we go to Tibet. This story is the, this painting is the image of the prodigal son painted in 12 panels. It helps you get a context for why the artist did it this way. This is a, sorry, it didn't go for me a Tibetan circle of life there, and it's divided into 12 parts as well, too. One of the things you don't see in this image is the spiritual power that's holding on to the four, four parts of the circle that's part of the Tibetan image. This shows something that's painted in their idiom, but with completely different content. He's trying to give them an opportunity to understand more of the Son of God through this type of imagery. Another one of my favorites. Just kind of soak this one in. You've never imagined a log in your eyes this way before, have you? The Filipino artist who painted this does remind me at times how I am viewed as a white, rich American coming from overseas to help my poor sisters and brothers in situations of dire poverty because I am carrying a white man's burden. And typically, Filipinos are too polite to let me know that and to let me see what I'm doing wrong. And I love this image because it's a slap in my face in a good way, this just stark reality of that. From here now, we move to Malaysia, the woman with the bent back. Hannah Vergeis composed this image and the accompanying poem. I'll read a portion of the poem. I am bent, nay, double bent. I see the earth I tread upon. I see my toes and feet. All day long I see the grass I trample on and the stones that hurt my feet. 
I want to look to the heavens, to look to God and see the stars, but I can't. You see, I am double bent. For 18 long years, this is my life. Jesus set her free. From freedom, pain, and sorrow, we travel to Denmark. For To me, this haunting image of Jesus in Gethsemane being comforted by an angel. The Scandinavian, the actually uh, Danish artist, framed beauty with an androgynous blonde angel in a dark and haunting landscape. It strikes a deep resonance in me, but you know what? I hold the same standards of beauty as the artist. I'll never forget when an African student, when I was teaching in Kenya, asked me, do American men really like their women that skinny? He said, there's nothing to hold on to. <laughs> Images of beauty are culturally constrained. And this is a reminder to me, but I resonate with that image. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. Now we travel on a much darker note to Germany. This was painted by an American artist, but obviously dealing with issues of the Nazi regime. Painted by Joseph Pisani, this haunting image brings alive the brutality of those who arrested the King of Kings. You notice the man holding a flashlight, he's got a name attached. It's the artist's name. He's putting himself in that position. And I have to ask myself, where would I have been if I was a German in the late 1930s and Christ had come to live among us? Another scene, this time from Korea, and this image is striking in three ways. First, you'll note that Jesus, while definitely male, is wearing a woman's dress. I didn't know that because I didn't know what traditional Korean dress looked like until a Korean student pointed that out to me one day in class. But don't mistake white for a wedding color. It's more typically a color for funerals. Jesus marching on to his death. You notice the cross is shaped a little bit weirdly. Superimposed an image of North and South Korea, flipped around and rotated a bit, and you'll see what the artist is trying to say. Male and female, North and South Korea, united through the death of this one man. I'm not sure I'd like to see this every Sunday. It's in a Brazilian church. The sculpture was tortured in Brazilian prisons during cruel torture sessions when hovering between life and death, the crucified Jesus gradually imposed himself on the sculptor. Since then, the sculptors modeled one tortured Christ after another. This one's in the sanctuary of a church in Brazil. He did not debone the death of Christ. We tend to sanitize it when we think of it and ignore the horror that it was. This is a hard image to look at but it comes out of the, the artist's experience. It comes out of his own life. Last image we will look at, called Pieta Kwangju, memorializes Koreans, Korean students especially, dying in a brutal repression by their government in 1980 in a city called Kwangju, South Korea. Today, that event is marked by South Koreans as the start of democracy, as we know it today in their country. The irony is this was painted by a Japanese artist. And if you know your history, Japan brutally ruled Korea from 1910 to 1946 for 36 years. I had a deep repression. So I wonder what the Japanese artist was thinking as he painted this image. I've taken you on a quick visual reconnaissance. It's only given you a taste of the full meal that's available. I invite you to join me Thursday, 7.30, Blanchard 339, if you want to see more. I'm putting together a series of shorter videos and more images again. I've got a lot more to go through. I don't have as many stories for the rest of them as I do for these. But at least you'll get a chance to come and see more of how other people imagine Christ around the world. As a conclusion to this visual meditation, I invite you to reflect and this video on Christ's life with Fernando Otega singing in the background. As you ask, as you watch, ask Jesus to touch your heart. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, 
in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, oh, and when I come to die, and when I come to die, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You can have all this world You can have all this world But give me Jesus Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful imagination of artists who draw us closer to you through imagining Jesus in ways that makes sense to them in their time, their space, their social setting, their culture, their language, their context. Bless us this day through the memories of things that we have seen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.